Good morning. Can you hear me all this? Can you all hear me this morning? I sound maybe a little loud. Leon does a great job, but that sound guy some days I think he should be fired. So can you turn me down just a little bit? Test one, two, is that better? Because I might get kind of loud later and I don't want to hurt anybody's ears. So <laughs> uh, well this is a little bit different, isn't isn't it, this morning? It's been a long time since I was given the privilege of being able to preach here at Chancellor, so um, I was thinking about it earlier. Um, there's probably people here that didn't know that I do this on occasion, so you're in for something. <laughs> <coughs> yep. <laughs> I was really nervous earlier um, just because I haven't done this for a while, but I realized a little bit ago when I was talking to Amy that you can't fire me this morning, so we're going to get through this together. Um. I looked back earlier this week, and I think there's only been one Sunday in the past 85 Sundays that Pastor Mark has taken the day off. It's around that number. I think we had one snow day that we canceled that he didn't preach. But otherwise, in one form or another, um, he has been here helping lead worship and preparing for us. So he has certainly deserved a few days of R&R. So I hope he gets that in the next few weeks. Um, We're so blessed to have a pastor and a pastor's wife who's so dedicated to this family here. Uh, he's a tough act to follow. Uh, I'm going to try to do my best to, to lead today in a way that God has called me to lead, to lead, and I'm not going to try to keep up with him, which for me I thought would mean that we're going to have a lot fewer slides this morning. But then I got some pictures sent, so here we go. Welcome. I think I got that part already. Um, <laughs> yeah. They served at the banquet this week, and Amy and my sister took some pictures, so I'm not sure who these came from, but um, 286 plates served, or meals, and how much time? It goes pretty fast, doesn't it? I mean, it takes a long time to get everything ready, but once they show up, it does not take very long. So we just want to say thank you for all those that were willing to give of their time and uh, to give of themselves to people who need it. So... We all give them a hand, say thank you. I think we should. Um, just a reminder, your, your new mailboxes, the July mailboxes are in your, our calendars are in your mailboxes, so don't forget to grab those on your way out. Um, one thing we want to make you all aware of, I know Mark sent out an email to all of you, but um, there is going to be an informational meeting at Good News Church in Sioux Falls. It should help answer a lot of questions um, about the Alliance of Reformed Churches, which is the denomination that our classes is looking at joining up with if we do leave the RCA. It's tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Um, due to his vacation, Pastor will not be there, but anyone can go. You don't have to be you know, on a leadership team. If you want to go and attend and find out more information about where we're heading, I would encourage you to go to that. There should be plenty of room. So, um, Yeah, since it's been a while, uh, since I've given a message, I was going to pretend that um, there wasn't going to be any recording and no potential of thousands of people watching it, but the more I thought about it, the tougher it got, so here we are. Um, so if you're watching on Facebook this morning, or if you're watching later on our website, um, I would like to say welcome to you too, and, and I just want you to know that you're getting the B team when it comes to preaching this morning, and so <laughs> I would encourage you to tune in again in two weeks. Um, it'll be much better, I promise. Um, I did say two weeks because next week, don't forget, we do not have services here. They will be in Lenox at the park, um, 1030, I think. Does it say it on there? Yeah, 1030. Um, you can bring a bottle of water with you. Or bring, definitely bring a chair because they won't have seating for everybody. So, um, yeah, next, next Sunday, 1030, the Lenox Park. A few more announcements for you. Um, the Dewards will be gone all of, well, they were gone pretty much most of this week and all of next week, right? So uh, just remember that. Uh, Rod is still in need of prayers. George Jungling um, found out this morning that he has been moved to hospice, and his brother Charlie has gone out, brother, right, has gone out to spend time with him. So definitely keep that family in your prayers. Um, yeah, Donna Johnson, I found, um, Don called me this week, and the last time I talked to Delina, Donna's outlook wasn't good, and 
she got on this clinical trial thing and she got a report this week that said all tumors are gone. Wow, right? Amen. I mean, it's unbelievable. It is, it is a miracle. Um, yet not a clean bill of health, but way better than anybody could have dreamed. That's how good our God is. So we want to say thank you for that. Um, most of them, I think you know, uh, one that's not up there is Dave and Rachel made 52 years of marriage on Friday. So I think that is worth a clap. Yep. And definitely Daryl and Karen. Um, it'll be 61 years on Tuesday. Where are they at? They're here. They're not. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, and they're going to serve us cake this morning to, uh, to celebrate their anniversary. So congratulations to Daryl and Karen. You know, it's two days. I think they'll make it. They should be all right, right? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the band to come up. And while they're doing so, I just want to say thanks again for your, your uh, commitment to give and to take care of this church. I believe that God has blessed us through some pretty tough times here at CRC. And your willingness to give back um, is evidence that you see it too. Grace and peace to you this morning from our God, our Heavenly Father, and Savior Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Father God, we acknowledge that you precede us in all that we do, from, from waking in the morning to making coffee and certainly coming to your house for worship. We thank you, Holy God, for the promise that where two or more gather, you are there with them. We're here today, Lord, to spend time with you, to spend time in your word, to give back a portion of what you give to us, and God, to come to praise your name. Last week, we sang that there were 10,000 reasons to praise you, and this week, the team will remind us that, that you light our way through your amazing grace. God, it is my hope that you fill us with your grace so we can be a light in your world. Creator God, we're, we're so thankful for good reports from doctors. We're thankful for marriages that, that not only hold together but thrive and are an example for those of us who are trying to reach such a milestone. We're thankful for pastors, for our pastor, for, for Kathy, and for all who are willing to serve week after week. Father God, we pray for those who need healing, for those who need strength, and for those who need to find peace. Lord, we're grateful for opportunities to serve at places like the, blank, the banquet, and for those who are willing to help. Grant us all the wisdom to see those moments when you're asking us to be your hands and feet. And then the courage to do, to do what your kingdom needs. Now I ask that you continue to bless this place and bless the people in it as we worship you, O oh God, our hope, our comfort, and our redeemer. Amen. I'd invite you to stand with us as we sing My Lighthouse. Sorry, it wasn't on. There we go.
seated. team. Most of the time I'm standing up there, right? I don't get to hear you guys sing. You guys sound really good. Before we dive into the message for this morning, I just have to say that it's kind of a crazy summer for 
for Stephanie and I. Uh, we have four or five close friends whose children are getting married. Um, I have my niece, Katie, who's getting married, and my nephew, Levi, who's getting married in September. Not to each other. It's two different weekends. <laughs> And our youngest, Lane, was just married to his new bride just three short weeks ago. Um, yeah, it's been kind of been kind of tough keeping up with the calendar. I want you to think about this with me for a second. Lane had a new job interview. Then he and his fiance looked at a new apartment. Haley graduated from SDSU with her bachelor's in bachelor's of science in pharmacy. Uh, Lane got the new job, started the new job. They moved into the apartment. They got married. They spent five days in Cabo on their honeymoon, and now they live together. And this all happened in about a 30-day span. So if you want to pray for them, I think um, that life gets to be a little more boring, I think would be a good prayer, right? Reset reality a little bit. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I don't know at my age if I would deal well with that many changes coming at me so fast. And I know that's an extreme example. But there are a lot of changes happening right now in our world. And most of them are out of our control. Not that they're bad changes. Most of them are just playing their part in this crazy thing that we call life. Today, with all the changes that are happening, I want to take a closer look at our God and this word change. But before we do that, would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather in this safe place that you have provided for us, we ask for your presence to be known to us. Lord, let it be your voice that we hear this morning. And Jesus, as we explore this word change, I ask that you open our eyes to your truth. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask that you take that truth and place it on our hearts so we can turn back to it when this, this world that we live in tries to convince us of its lies. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our minds be pleasing in your eyes, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So in the spirit of the word change, I'm going to do things a little bit different this morning. I need you all to agree with me before we go any further on one thing. Going to need a little more space. The Apostle John wrote these words. It's John 1.1. 1, 1. It's the way he starts his book, and I want you to read it with me. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So I have an important question for you this morning. When it comes to how God wants us to live our lives, is this book, is the Word of God our authority? Because the answer has to be definitive. It, it can't be maybe or, or kind of. It has to be yes. Do we all agree on that? Amen. Because you never really know until you ask. Honestly, I was a little bit scared that somebody might say no. I'm going to move forward that we're all on the same page and that the written word of God is our authority. So as I work through the message for today, remember that my authority, along with all of you, comes from here. It comes from Scripture. It may be a different translation this morning, but it comes from God's word, the Bible. Now that we're all on the same page, let's get back to this word change. How many of you look forward to change? Someone the other day told me that the only group, the only age group that looks forward to changes are babies. I'm not sure that's always true. I see Barry sitting there, and I think there's probably some changes coming in his life he's looking forward to. Gene and Linda, they're not here this morning, but I'm sure Steve and Sheila, you've got to be looking forward to some changes, right? 
I think sometimes we look forward to changes. But most of the time, I, I think we dread them. Don't we? And, and most of the time, it's just because of the unknown. It's because of what we don't know about the change. I think we'd be shocked to realize how many times in the course of a normal day, we actually change our plans or reverse course or pull out the eraser to delete an appointment that we made for that week or, or a task that we had set forth for the month. Have you ever thought about that? Changing our minds feels natural to us as humans. It's hard to even envision life without it. In most instances, changes are harmless, and they're typically the result of unforeseeable circumstances or, or caused by changes that other people make that directly affect our lives. As humans, it's just kind of the way life works. But what would it mean for us if God were to change his mind? Can he? Can God change his mind? Could he? Or are all his plans and purposes unchangeable? I read an article one time that used the word immutable, which means not having the ability to change. Is our God immutable? The answer to that question is not easy. It can't be answered with a simple yes or no. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to explain to you why God can't change, why we don't want God to change, and what that means for us as his children. Immutability or the inability to change is a property that belongs to the very essence of God in the sense that he can neither gain new attributes nor lose any. To put it crudely, God doesn't grow. There's no increase or decrease in the divinity of God. If God were to increase in either quality or quantity, it would mean that he was incomplete prior to the increase. If he were to decrease, it would mean that he would be incomplete after. God is incapable of development, either positively or negatively. He neither evolves nor devolves. God will never be wiser, more loving, more powerful, or holier than he was or ever will be. The truth is at least implied in God's declaration to Moses in Exodus 3.14. God says, I am who I am. And it's explicit in other texts, like James 1.17, where it says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God, our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or cast shifting shadow. Or Malachi 3, 6, which says, I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. And Hebrews 3, 18, or 13, 8, sorry, that says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. When we talk about the immutability of God, we're very close to the notion of his everlastingness. What I'm saying is that God never began. He, he never started to be, and he'll never cease to be. God in his life simply is, always was, and always will be. God didn't come into existence because to come into existence would be to change from nothing to something, and he'll never cease to exist because that would make, mean he'd have to change from something to nothing. God isn't young or old. He simply is. But the fact that, that God cannot change is not designed. It's not meant to keep us as his children from developing a relationship with him. Consider Romans 5, 6 through 11. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's in, who is especially good. But God showed his great love to us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. 
So now we can rejoice in the wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. There are skeptics out there that would say this piece of scripture, the new covenant Jesus brought to earth by his crucifixion on the cross is evidence that our God, that this God of ours had to come up with a new plan, that he had to change his mind and send Jesus to earth. I'm guessing they only read the New Testament because some historians consider over 350 verses of the Old Testament to be predictions of the coming Son of God, going all the way back to the third chapter of Genesis. I think it's a pretty short-sighted view to, to, to the magnitude of the cohesiveness of the entire Bible, of the entire Scripture, to say that God had to change his mind. However, it, it does bring up the question, doesn't it? of God's seeming ability to change his mind? Let, let's take a look at Scripture and what God has to say. It's Isaiah 46, 9 through 11. Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God. There is none like me. Only I can tell you the future before it happens. Everything I plan will come to pass, for I do whatever I wish. I will call a swift bird of prey from the east, a leader from a distant land to come and do my bidding. I have said what I would do, and I will do it. There's, there's no hint of change in that portion of Scripture, is there? Like Psalms 33, 10 and 11, which says, The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes, but the Lord's plan will stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. Certainly, no mention of God changing there. I could go on and on with scripture that reminds us that God's will will be done, but I just have one more for you. It's Hebrews 6, 17. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. It may seem to us sometimes like God has changed his mind. At least sometimes, right? I mean, it seemed that way to me. For example, it wasn't my idea to go from a guy making good money, building houses, uh, living the dream of financial stability, to a guy that couldn't make a house payment and was sitting in seminary class. That huge change in my life was not my idea. In the midst of that change, it seemed like God had changed his mind on what he wanted for my life. I know that, that might sound a little bit ridiculous now, but at the time, that's the way I would have explained it. If you remember, just a few short weeks ago, uh, Pastor Mark talked about Jonah and the great fish. After that whole fish thing, God sent Jonah to Nineveh again to warn them that God was going to destroy them. So he went. Jonah went and warned them, and they believed Jonah. And they immediately changed their ways. And because they did, God decided not to destroy him, destroy them. But did he change his mind? The fact that God declared it is his intention to destroy Nineveh only to withhold his hand when they repented doesn't, doesn't mean that he changed his mind. On the contrary, if God would have destroyed Nineveh after they repented, he would have shown himself to be mutable or, or changeable. In the Bible, there are many words used to describe our God, words like loving, forgiving, understanding, just, fair, powerful, caring, our light, our redeemer, father, friend. How could God be all these things and at the same time destroy Nineveh? He couldn't. So God didn't change his mind. He changed the people of Nineveh. He changed their minds. They heard the warning from Jonah, and they knew their only chance was to repent from, the ways that, from their ways and turn back to God, to the God that could not and would not change his mind. He would not change from being that loving, that caring, forgiving, redeeming God that he had always been. As for me, as for my story, from carpenter to seminarian, 
That didn't change his mind. It changed mine. I guess if I wanted to, I could be cynical and, and think that God destroyed my company and almost me in the process just so that his will could be done. One time I may have even said something like that out loud. I don't believe that to be true. Not anymore. I can look back at that time and, and see all the work that God was doing in my life. All the molding, all the chiseling, all the shaping. In that or through that process, God was working to change my mind because he wouldn't change his. Let me try to explain what I think happens a lot of times when, when we think God is changing his mind. What happens is we try to justify our actions as God's will. Now, when you stand up for yourself, when you stand up for what you think is right in your life, I believe that God is interested in that. When you're focused on what you're doing, God notices your effort. He notices your commitment. But that does not mean that's his plan for your life. It doesn't mean that he that it doesn't mean that God is in support of the torture you believe to be putting yourself through for him. I justified the torture that I was going through with the Dream Builder Company. I told myself that that 60 or even 70 hours a week is just what it takes to make a company like that work. A business partner that drove me crazy was necessary to do the things that I couldn't do or, or simply didn't want to do. Being away from my family, spending, spending too much time away from them, putting them too low on my priority list. It's just the price you pay when you want to be your own boss. When you want to have a new truck. When you want to have a new house. But here's the deal. Doing things because you think it's right or, or justifiable doesn't mean that that's God's will for your life. And with all the suffering or all the torture that's going on in the world, it seems pretty clear to me that it is God's will for us to sometimes live in our own torture, our own torture until we decide to do something different. Just to be clear, when I say torture or suffering, I'm not referring to the people like the ones served at the banquet this week. I'm referring to the people that stay in the job that they claim to hate or the relationship that's not healthy for them or refusing to get treatment for an addiction that's slowly killing them. There are a lot of ways that we can torture ourselves. Trying to justify them as God's will for your life or claiming that it's your cross to bear is only going to keep you living in that torture longer. God isn't going to change his mind or his will just so you can feel justified. And I'm not saying this morning that we're all living in that torture. Although I think some of us probably are, just won't admit it. I'm saying that we're all a work in progress. We're not finished. As long as we're in God's hands, there's still work to be done in our lives. It doesn't matter what part of the process of this life that you're in. All that matters is that you're still in God's hands. As long as you are, there are going to be changes. Sometimes they're big, like losing a company, and sometimes they're small. But they're all changes. And it's not always fun. But at the same time, change is not always bad. Change may be scary, but if it's a change that our master, that, that, our, that our creator is orchestrating, it will be better than the torture that you're living in now. And God's will to make a change in your life does not happen by accident. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Lucky for us, God can change. We're blessed to have a God that is always good and can't change. And since he can't change, guess who gets to? I think, I think that's at least part of what this whole process is about. I think that's part of the reason we're all on this journey together. That's why God has given us this family to be on a journey with, to, to come alongside and to take steps in the right direction, to encourage each other through, through times of torture and times of triumph. I understand as well as anybody that change can be scary. If you had asked me 20 years ago, I'll be up in front here preaching someday. 
probably would have laughed in your face. And although it's still kind of scary sometimes, it's much better than the torture I was living in. Now I'm thankful for that change. Been a lot of changes lately, hasn't there? COVID made a lot of changes. Our new president does things a lot different than the old one did. Two years ago, we had so much water, we didn't know what to do with it all. And, well, you know what it's like out there this year. Change. This church, our denomination is going through a change. And it's not going to be easy. But something is going to change. I've heard some grumblings about changing our church's denomination. And I get it. I do. I joke with, joke with Kathy all the time that, that she might be a year or two older than I am. But I still have um, seniority on her because this place, this church has been a part of my whole life. And I'm not saying that I'm excited about changing denominations. I'm not saying that. But I would rather do that than try to find a new pastor. I'd rather do that than try to redefine our theology. I'd rather do that than try to explain why Scripture is no longer our authority. There are people in my life that would ask why God or why I or why we as Christians don't love everybody. The hard truth is that if we're going to live with Scripture as our authority, there are going to be times when society, when the people out there aren't going to agree with our, convic our conviction to uphold our beliefs. Hear me when I say that I, that, that I'm not saying that it's okay that, that we try to exclude the LGBTQ community. Last week, Pastor Mark said that we can't live by feeling alone. What I would add to that is, is we should be living our lives by the authority of Scripture. And it says that we're all made perfect in God's eyes, in God's plan, and that marriage is meant for a man and a woman. And if Scripture is our authority, like we all agreed that it was, that it is, then our choice to make a change should be easy. If Scripture is our authority, it is not our job to judge, but God's alone. And if Scripture is our authority, and Christ is our example, then we should love everybody even when we don't understand, even when we don't agree, even when we might want to exclude. We love because God loved us first. And we love because without his love, we can't be forgiven. And we love because if we don't, then the lost children of this world don't stand a chance of understanding, of knowing the love that you and I know. Change is going to continue to happen, both in our personal lives and in this church. But if we keep scripture, if we keep God as our authority, I believe he will lead us through this torture, this change, faithfully and gently. I'm going to ask the team to come up and lead us through our closing song. As I was working through the message for this week, this song kept playing over and over in my head. And I hope that it plays over and over in your heads this week as a reminder of who, of who is in charge today, who has been in charge since the beginning of time, and who will be in charge on the day that we get to stand before our God in glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are God alone, and that you are the authority. And we want to thank you for the authority that you've given us through your written word, for the promise that you'll never change. Amen. Please stand with us.
about anything that you heard this morning, please find me after the service. I don't promise to have all the answers, but I do know the one who does. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace. Normally, on the, at the end of a service, I hope that you all have a great week and you better be back again next week, but we'll be in Lenox, so better be back in two weeks. Have a good day. You guys did a good job this morning. <laughs>